hymn number 146. Uh, very familiar Christmas carol, and we want to sing it tonight, Silent Night, number 146. Let's stand together and sing. Turn me to the book of Hebrews tonight. Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. We'll be looking at one verse tonight. We'll be looking at several verses, but this will be our text verse tonight in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14. And the Bible says, Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs? Of salvation. May the Lord help us tonight in the preaching and hearing of His Word. Let us go to the Lord in prayer once again at this time. And Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, we thank you for the privilege of prayer. Lord, the privilege, Lord, to, uh, to come to your presence, Father. Lord, to, to thank you and to praise you, Father, Lord, for your, for your goodness, Lord, your faithfulness. Thank you, Father, for the grace and mercy, Father, and Lord, for salvation tonight through the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, we just uh, thank you, Lord, for this time of year, Lord. It just ministers and speaks to our heart, Lord, to remember the gift, Lord, that was given uh, so many years ago. And Thank you, Lord, for that free gift, Lord, that we could have the forgiveness of sin. Lord, that we could be a, a, a child of God and, and, Lord, have a home in heaven. And Father, we uh, pray for those tonight in our own families, in our own communities, Lord, at the workplace, Lord, at those who do not know Christ. And Father, that we would be that light. Lord, that we would be that salt, Father, Lord, that would help point them to Christ. Father, we 
again, lift up those requests. Lord, you know every need and every heart, and we just pray that you would just minister and to help to each need in each case. And Lord, we just lift up our pastor and his family, and Lord, just help them, Lord, during this time, and Lord, to the, uh, the preaching of the funeral, Father. And Lord, may the Spirit of God just take the message and, and speak to hearts, Lord, about death and, and Lord, about eternity. Lord, we just thank you again. Lord, I just ask for your help tonight. And Lord, just give me uh, the grace, Lord, that I need, Father. And Lord, just help me to stand. And I thank you, Father, that no man stands alone, Father, behind this pulpit. Lord, we thank you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. As, we, as my preacher, or pastor had called me and, and uh, had mentioned to me about preaching tonight, and, and so as um, I was thinking about I, I was trying to maybe think about a a Christmas theme or, or or something along that line, and and here for the last week or so, I'd been doing a little study of of of, of angels, and uh, just uh, uh, taking some notes of some things that I've been reading and and, 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 and individuals that I've been listening to, and and uh, so as I was going through my study, and I was sitting there and I was praying, and I was just going through some some messages and scripture, and then Lord just impressed on my heart to share with what, you know, he has given to me, and, and uh, I hope it'll be a blessing to you tonight. And, but I want to look at angels tonight, and, and we're not going to be talking about me as much as Lisa may call me angel, but, uh, but no, we're going to talk about heaven's angels. We're going to talk about uh, ministering angels tonight, and, and uh, some very interesting things that I've learned of, about angels and, and um, their, their ministry, if you will, of how, they, um, how God is using them to serve. And there are several things that I've, I've come across, but I just want to touch on two or three tonight and uh, just to uh, speak on these. But when we think about angels, you know, and speaking of those that's passed on, we see where angels are used to carry His children into the presence of God. Using angels. And, and, and we notice that tonight here in Luke chapter 16. In very familiar scripture where we see where Lazarus was carried by angels into Abraham's bosom. But then we see when the rich man, whenever he opens up his eyes, we see that he is in hell that night. And we don't see where angels carry him or them into hell, but we see where angels carry uh, Lazarus and, and those that... Uh, uh, have trusted in the Lord and have believed God where they carry them into the presence of the Lord. But we notice some other places in Scripture where we see angels and, and reference to angels. And a very familiar Scripture there in uh, looking at 2 Kings tonight, chapter 2, verse 11. Chapter 2, verse 11 tonight. And the Bible says, And it came to pass, as they still went on and talked, that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire, and horses of fire, and parted them both asunder, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. So this is a very familiar scripture where we see where Elijah was, was carried into heaven into the presence of God. And, you know, as we read, we always hear about the chariots of fire and the horses of fire, and carried it by a whirlwind into heaven. And as I was studying this, and, and, and one of the, uh, the preachers that I was listening to made some reference about this uh, verse here referring to angels themselves that carried Elijah up into heaven. And uh, he had some uh, verses there to, to reference to. In Psalms chapter 104 verse 4, the Bible says, Who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame and fire. In Psalm 68 verse 17, we see where the, the chariots of God are 20,000. Even thousands of angels, the Lord is among them as in Sinai and in the holy place. In Psalms 18 verse 10, the Bible says, And he rode upon a cherub and did fly. Yea, he did fly upon the wings of the wind. So we see here where, we, where he talks about the chariots of fire and the horses of fire. And as he was carried up by a whirlwind into the heavens, it was a reference he believes, and what I believe tonight too, that Elijah was carried into the presence of God by angels themselves. In verse, uh, Psalms 116, verse 15, the Bible says, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of His saints. And then Revelation 14, verse 13, the Bible says, And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right blessed are the dead which die in the Lord. 
And so we think about tonight as, as a child of God, as each, as the Bible says, is appointed uh, to each one of us to die. We're all going to face that, that call one day. But for some, you know, they may dread or, or may fear of, of, of death. But when you think about this and what we read from Scripture, we don't need to dread death. Because when you think about what God has given to us and prepared for each and one of us, that when we leave this world, when we close our eyes here, and when we open our eyes up in glory to be in the presence of the Lord, I believe tonight that God is going to give us heavenly angels that's going to carry us up into the presence of God. I, I believe that tonight with what we read in Luke chapter, chapter 16 and in 2 Kings chapter 2 verse 11. So what does that tell you and I tonight? I believe it tells you and I tonight that when we leave this world, we're going first class. I don't believe we're going to be running coach and I don't think that we're going to be standing there thumbing our way on up to heaven. But God has prepared it for you and I that when we leave this world, we're going first class. And when you think about chariots tonight... When you read in the scriptures, every time that chariots are mentioned, who is riding in those chariots? Is it just the common folks? Is it the poor individuals that's riding chariots in, the, in scripture? No, but when we see in scripture, when chariots are mentioned, it is kings. It is princesses that are riding in chariots. So what does that tell you tonight? That we're going to heaven when it's our time to go that we are going to go in first class. So we see tonight angels that are present when we leave this world. Also tonight when they're in Jude chapter 1 uh, verse 9 the Bible says Michael the archangel disputed with Satan over the body of Moses. And we also see in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 15 where angels will be present when saints are resurrected from death in the rapture. So we see angels all over the, the scripture and how they are, what their job is and, and, and how they are ministering saints to you and I that are saved tonight. How, how God is using them. I mean, I don't understand. I've always you know, read about that you know, when we close our eyes here, we open our eyes in the Lord. But I believe there's going to be that point in time where we're going to be escorted by angels into heaven. And as we think about angels tonight, we also see places where angels are, are guardian angels. We read in Scripture where angels, uh, we see them in physical form, and, and we read uh, uh, several verses of those tonight. But also I want to look tonight, something that just blessed my heart when I was reading and, and studying this. But when we think about angels... As one preacher said, he said, they, they serve as heavenly ushers for John, John the Revelator. Looking over in the book of Revelations, uh, chapter 1, Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, the Bible says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass, and he sent and signified by his angels unto his servant, John. We see in Revelation 1.1, Revelation is both from Christ and about Christ. Since Christ is the revelation of God himself, God gave the revelation to Christ to be shown to John by means of an angel. And this revelation refers to an unveiling of God's program for the world. So we see how John here is, is uh, or, or this heavenly angel is, I guess if you will, be, being an usher here for John and, and getting ready to show him some things, some things that was getting ready to, or will one day come to pass. And as we read over in the book of Revelation chapter 17, verses 1 through 3, and there came one of the seven angels which had, had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. And there in verse 3 he said, So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting upon a scarlet-colored beast for the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. So we see here in the book of uh, 
revelations that the angel was getting ready to show John some amazing things. He was going to show him some things that was going to take place. Now, think about what John was getting ready to see. 2,000 years ago, roughly, we just say that what John was seeing, now think about this, it's what you and I are seeing today. Because we see what's going on in the world today. I, I believe that the, the, the time is getting closer. We can see the evilness that is just seems to be enhancing. Uh, whenever you read, what is it, uh, uh, 1 Timothy, uh, what, chapter 6, when it talks about perilous times, or chapter 3, talking about when perilous times shall come. And you read every one of those things. I mean, it's not like nothing new. But I believe that we're seeing that verse right there catching another gear. We're, we're, we're seeing things just really just coming to pass and things seem to be just enhancing more and more. So you think about it. We've been seeing this however long that we've been alive. But you think about what John was seeing 2,000 years ago. I mean, the, 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 the technology, the, uh, 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 all the things that, that's going on, I mean, that would be hard for him to really comprehend or understand. And for John to be, I know that he was caught up in the spirit, and I know that was a, a spiritual moment for him, but think about the awkwardness that he was feeling. I mean, I, I was sort of thinking along my own lines. Think about the fear that maybe he was seeing or as, as if it was being revealed to me of what I was seeing and, and, and never seeing anything like that before. And then John is, is being revealed to John at this time. But I believe we see here as the angel serves as a heavenly usher for John to to uh, help him in the midst of his awkwardness, the midst of his fear, to bring him courage and to help him. And as we went on there in, in, in verses, uh, verses 21 through 9 and 10, now this is what blessed my heart right here. And I believe this right here might have what encouraged him and helped him here. But in verses uh, 21, verses 9 and 10, the Bible says, And there came up to me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven plagues. I mean, think about that. Here he came up to John and, and had all these vials, these judgments that was going to be brought on upon the earth. I mean, I guess I'd be in fear too. But what he was, get, what he was seeing, you know, thank God, we ain't going to see. Think about that. What John was seeing, we're not going to be able to see because we're not going to be here, thank God. But we see where the angel that had the vows and the seven plagues, he said, He talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. What the angel was getting ready to show to John. And whenever he said, Come hither, I'm, I'm, I just picture in my mind. I remember whenever we had went uh, to... Um, uh, Linville Caverns. Some years back, Dylan was little, and we went through the caverns, and as we was coming back out, we was, Lisa and Dylan and myself, were sort of the last ones. And so as we, we was getting ready to head on out, the, the usher, if you will, or the guide that had us, that, that was with us, said, okay, well, everybody just head on out to the door. Well, they told us to, you just wait right here. And she said, I'm going to show you something. And she looked at Dale and said, do you want to see a bat? He said, yeah, well, we all did. Yeah, I want to see the bat too. But what that bat was, right there on the wall, part about head high to Dylan, was a bat there hanging on the wall. Everybody that came through there walked by that bat, didn't see the bat. But the guide stood there and shone the flashlight on that bat. And we got to see it. We just thought it was a neat thing. And it was an amazing thing that everybody walked by. Not everybody noticed that bat. But what she revealed to us because she knew what was there. And I think about what the revelator or what the angel was revealing to John because what the angel knew what was there. And back in verse 9, he said, And he talked with me saying, Come hither. I want you to come here. I've got something to show you. He said, I want to show thee the bride. And I'm going to show thee the lamb's wife. 
Now, as I sat there and read that, I, I just got just a little excited. And as I was just sitting there thinking that what John was seeing, he saw the bride of Christ. Do you realize this, this tonight who he was looking at? He was looking at you. He was looking at you and you. And he was looking at me. Part of the family of God. We're part of the bride of Christ. John was looking at you and I. And I'm going to be honest tonight. I got a little bit in the flesh. I was thinking, I hope I was in there in the front row. John, just look at me. Look at me. No. But it crossed my mind. What John was looking at. 2,000 years ago, the angel revealed to him, I'm going to let you see the bride of Christ, the one whom he died for, shed his blood for so that we could be saved. And I thought, he was looking towards me. I don't say he was looking at me, but that day, he was looking towards me. That just blessed my heart when I just sat there and read that. He was looking into the future and he seen me. Thank God. Not what i done, not what you've done, but what Jesus did for us on the cross of Calvary. As we're celebrating this year, for unto you is born this day in the city of David, what a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And I'm thankful tonight that he's my Savior. So we see him tonight as a heavenly usher. We, we see angels that are uh, uh, ministering spirits even when it's our time to go. But we can also see angels tonight that have free will. That they have possessed tonight a personality. Looking in Luke chapter 2 tonight... Luke chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. And the Bible says, And suddenly there was with the angel a, heavenly, a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace and goodwill towards men. We see tonight that they possess a personality. I mean, they was praising going on. They was, they was glorifying God that day when they announced to the uh, shepherds out there abiding in the field, watching over their flock by night. And they were glorifying God. And I don't believe that it was a, like, like a robocall whenever you hear on the phone. I don't believe that they were saying, Glory to God in the highest, goodwill towards men on earth. No. I believe they might have been getting just a little bit beside themselves. I believe they was probably just getting a little excited about what God was doing. I don't know how much the angel really knew. Well, well, we'll get into that here just in a minute. But about understanding what all salvation is. But I know that they were proclaiming the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. They, they possessed a personality. But also tonight we also see with angels that they possess intellect. Angels are, are smart individuals. And we notice that tonight when we just look at Lucifer. And we know who he is tonight. He, he was an archangel. He was in the high rank of angels in the service of God. But we know what happened with him, that pride got into his life. He wanted to sit his throne above God. He, he, he wanted to be God. And so we, now we see some things that Satan does here on this earth. But we see tonight that he is an intellectual. In 2 Corinthians tonight, in chapter 11, verse 3. In verse 3, Paul said here to the church, he said, But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtility, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Lucifer, or Satan tonight, he is, excuse me, he is an intellectual being. And his desire is to beguile us. His desire is to deceive us, to, to be deceptive, trickery. Subtility just means craftiness. That he has a way of, of presenting. We remember back in the garden when he came to Eve. 
And the Bible says that he was more subtile than any other creature in the garden. And he was, uh, uh, and he beguiled Eve because of the fact that he twisted. He took the word of God, and if you read the word of God, you'd think that, well, I mean, it sounded pretty good. But he deceived her. And she gave in to what he was saying. And you realize tonight that, that that's his desire? I mean, God made salvation simple, didn't he? And the things about Christ is simple. But what he wants to do is to corrupt your mind and mine. And I believe also tonight with, 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 with all honesty that there are people who are sincerely saved but maybe never had the direction, maybe never really had the discipleship to help them grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And when we look today, there is so much stuff out there today that is even brought in under the umbrella of Christianity. But a lot of the doctrine is wrong. And what being fed this false doctrine is leading them to confusion. They may be sincerely saved. Somebody might have, you, you know, when you think about whenever you leave gospel tracks and, and, and whenever you uh, share the gospel with somebody, maybe sometime down the road they get saved. But maybe just not have the right kind of direction to get them maybe in, in, in a solid uh, uh, church where they can be fed the word of God and, 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 and where they can grow. But the devil will send somebody along to try to corrupt their mind. To, to get them believing something that, that is a false doctrine. You know, that there, there is so much uh, uh, doctrine today that, that wants to emphasize that you've got to do so much work to earn salvation. You, you've got to do so much work to even keep your salvation. You have to do this and, and you have to do that. Now, now think about that. If a person's been saved but then they're not being really fed to help them grow, and then they think, well, I've got to work so much. What do you think that's going to, the devil's going to do to their mind? Put doubt in their mind, to corrupt their mind, to make them even doubt their salvation. How much of a witness and how much for uh, being a light or salt for the Lord, how much is that going to be diminished? But that's his desire tonight, and he's crafty. He does it in such a way that if we're not careful, if, if we're not mindful that you and I could be corrupted in our mind and, and in our thoughts. I believe I shared some time ago about having a, an unprotected life. As a child of God, an unprotected life comes by not being in the Word of God like we need to be. Having an unprotected life, not, not being faithful to the house of God like we need to be. Having an unprotected life, not having a prayer life that we need to be as a child of God. And then when without that unprotected life, the very thing that's going to happen is God's not going to be as important to us as God ought to be. Winning souls and, and doing work is, is not going to be as important as maybe as it once used to be without a protective life. Unprotected life. He wants to corrupt our mind. What he wants to do to you and I is to get us to think wrong. That's it. If he can get you and I to start thinking wrong, then guess what? We're going to start acting wrong. I'm not talking about acting bad and vile and, and, and anything like that, but we won't be living the kind of life that will be honoring and pleasing to the Lord. But we also see tonight in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, the Bible says, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. What do we see there in that verse? That we see a society that are blinded. The devil's got them blinded for whatever reason. Maybe it's works. Maybe, well, uh, they're more concerned about maybe their work or, 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 or their place of business, of, you know, putting things that is more important than knowing God. Blinders on. Because the devil fears. Because the devil knows what the gospel will do to an individual. He says, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe, 
lest, that word means for fear, that the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. He never did want the gospel to shine unto you and tonight, but thank God for the grace of God tonight. God removed the blinders from our eyes and from our heart. Why? So that we could be saved. How much more tonight for you and I as a child of God, knowing what it was once to be blind. How much more tonight that we ought to be on our knees and begging God to remove the blinders of those that we know in our family, those that are friends and those that we work with because we know what it is to be blind to the gospel. Oh, our heart needs to be burdened. I don't know if our heart is not as... I believe sometimes that maybe we've just got such an unprotected life that we forgot where God has brought us from. But we see tonight that angels are, are intellectual. But we also see tonight that angels do have a free will. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, the Bible says, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them unto the chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. When God cast Satan out of hell, there was a slew of angels that went with him because they chose. They had a choice because they sinned. Angels sinned. And then not only that, but we see in 2 Timothy chapter 2, chapter 2, Verses 26, and the Bible says, And that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who had taken captive by him at his will. We see where angels made a choice to sin. We see where Satan has a will tonight. And his will tonight is what we already learned about to corrupt your mind and my mind that saved tonight. To try to, as Brother John said one Sunday morning, try to let's put you know, God on the back burner or to keep those that are blinded so they'll never be saved. Satan has a will tonight. And then in Jude chapter 1, verse 6, the Bible says, And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting change under darkness, under the judgment of of the great day. It implies here that they made a choice to leave. They left what God had created them for in serving Him. They made a choice to leave. So we see these angels, these angels that made a choice and, and those that got a will and, and those that made a choice to leave. The Bible refers to them to unclean spirits or, or to fallen angels. But we see over in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 21, where the Bible talks about the elect angels. And these angels are the night who decided, purposed in their heart, if you will, to, to be obedient to God. They chose to serve God. They didn't choose to, to sin and, and, and to fall away from God. The elect. And as I thought about this tonight, when you think about these angels... You never see in Scripture where they're redeemed. Never. Redemption was for you and me. You never see in Scripture where angels were redeemed. You ever heard the phrase, one and done? That's what happened to the angels. When they sinned, when they chose to leave, when they chose to be disobedient to God, they were given one choice or one chance. And when they chose to fall away from God, God kicked him out of heaven. And I thought, praise God, I'm glad God doesn't treat me like the way he done the angels. I'm glad I serve tonight a God of mercy. I'm glad tonight that I serve a God of grace. Because if the Lord tonight treated you and me like the angels were judged then probably tonight, if we weren't on already on our road to hell, we would be in hell tonight. We'd probably be in that place where the angels were being chained by darkness. 
That's where you and I would be at. And then by all rights, that's where you and I deserve tonight. But I'm glad, thank God, that we serve a God of mercy. I'm glad tonight that we serve a God of compassion. Because you see, God created these angels as ministering spirits. They were to serve God and, and, and worship God and, and praise God as we've seen there in Luke chapter 2. But I understand that tonight that the angels, they were to proclaim the good news. When they went to the shepherds out there in the field and, 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 and the angel appeared unto them and said, for, for, uh, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior which is Christ the Lord. They know about the salvation plan of God. But you see tonight, I don't believe that they knowed the salvation plan of God. Not like you and I know tonight. You see, God created the angels as ministering spirits. But tonight, when He created you and I, He created you and I for a purpose. He created you and I so that we could have a relationship with our Heavenly Father. Amen. And not only that tonight, but that we can have a fellowship with our Heavenly Father. It's not just about a relationship, but it's also about a deep and meaningful fellowship with Him. That's how God created you and I for. You see, the angels don't know. They tell about it. They proclaim it. But they don't know it. Not like you and I tonight. You and I that are saved tonight. I thought about what Paul said there in Philippians chapter 3 verse 10. He said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death. Paul's desire was that I would know the Lord. And that word know, I believe in the Greek it means or it speaks of Gnesko, I believe is how it's pronounced. But what it means tonight is an intimate relationship. You think about a husband and wife or a parent and child having that intimate relationship to where, you know, especially in, in a marriage that when you've married, been married a year to where you've been married 50 years that, that you grow in such a way that you'd almost get to the point of completing other people's sentences. You might be able to finish what he's getting ready to say or, or she may be thinking or already knowing what you're thinking and go ahead and tell you no before you even mention it. I mean, that's being intimate tonight. That, that, that's having a deep fellowship in marriage. Paul said that I may know him. That was Paul's desire. And that's God's desire for you and I tonight, that we may know him, not only in salvation, in a relationship, but also tonight in fellowship. You know, when we sing Amazing Grace... How sweet the sound that saved the wretch like me. Do you know tonight the angels can't sing that song tonight? When you think about that song, I'm redeemed by love divine. Glory, glory, Christ is mine. You're, and you and I are the only ones that, that can sing that tonight. Whenever we want to sing, just touching the hem of his garment. You and I tonight that are saved by God's grace, we're the only ones that can understand what that song means to you and I tonight. You see, the angels... Don't understand it. They can proclaim it in one sense, but from a salvation standpoint, they don't know what you and I know tonight. They know about it because God has sent them forth to proclaim it. But you and I get to share it because we've partaken of it. That I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, being made conformable unto his death. They were created ministering spirits. But you and I tonight, we've been created to have a relationship. And not only a relationship, but to have fellowship. I was reading today some quotes, and I'll close with this. What Christianity is. What Christianity is. And it said that it is a loving relationship between the child of God and the Heavenly Father through the Lord Jesus Christ in the power of the Spirit. 
I believe tonight there are a lot of people saved. And I believe that, you know, if you're saved and you're living that life that's going to represent a Christian, people's going to be able to see it. I mean, I ain't against wearing crosses or, or having Christian attire hats or T-shirts with sayings on them. I, I'm not against that whatsoever. But I think the greatest testimony tonight is whenever people can talk with you and people can look at your life and you don't have to say a thing, but they can tell that something's different about your life. That's Christianity. People say, well, are you a Christian? You know, we've heard the preacher say and many other people say, well, if you say, are you a Christian? Well, everybody's a Christian. But I believe tonight that there's a lot of people that are not Christians. They may be saved. Names written in the Lamb's Book of Life. They close their uh, eyes here. Angels going to take them up into glory in the presence of the Lord. But there's no Christian. And when there's no Christianity, I don't believe you have a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. And I believe that's what the Lord wants with you and I tonight. Because He created us to have fellowship. He created us to, so He could have a relationship with Him. And sometimes I'm so sad and sometimes in my thoughts and in my actions, asking the Lord, why do you even waste your time with me? But I'm thankful for His grace tonight. And again, I'll say it and I'll say it every time I preach. I'm thankful tonight for 1 John 1.9. Because the Bible says that he knoweth my frame and he remembereth that I'm dust. He knows who Chris Taylor is. He knows me better than I even know myself. When I ask God, when I flub up, when I mess up, and I say, God, why are you wasting your time with me? Lord, Lord, I, I did it again. I'm thankful for that word that says, like he told Paul, my grace is sufficient. I'm thankful for the grace of God tonight. You know, I, I don't even know if the, if the angels in night in heaven really understand what grace is. Well, I'm glad tonight that we know what the grace of God is tonight. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand to our feet tonight. Every head bowed and every eye closed and and I know we all got things on our heart. Raise a hand tonight. Heavenly Father, Lord, as we come to you tonight in Jesus' name, again, thanking you for the privilege of prayer. Thanking you, Father God, for who you are. And Lord, I'm just thankful that you are God. And Lord, that you're on the throne room of heaven. Lord, that you're in control. And Lord, there's nothing that goes by you, Lord, unknowingly, Lord. And Father, I'm thankful that you're not surprised tonight. We just thank you, Lord, for your goodness towards us. Lord, we just thank you, Father, for your promises and your word tonight. Your promises, Lord, that, that helps us. and Lord, that, that, that strengthens us. Lord, we thank you that the Holy Spirit of God that resides within us. Lord, we thank you again for salvation. Lord, for this time of year, Lord, remember the greatest gift that you gave your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray, Father, Lord, you just help me. Lord, to live a life, Lord, that my life reflects that. Lord, I'm not serving a dead Savior, but Lord, I'm serving a living Savior. Lord, we thank you for each one that's here tonight. Lord, we pray for our pastor and Dave and the family. Lord, we just pray you just comfort and help them, Lord, with the upcoming services. Lord, just give them unction from on high, Father. Lord, we just thank you for all that you do. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.